Thanks very much, Ed. Coming to Tucson is like coming home for me. Um, my uh, oldest son went all the way through the school system, born in Israel. My two daughters started school here, and my younger son and went all through the system and the university. My oldest daughter is still here. My grandchildren are here. I taught here 28 years. As Ed said, I brought him and others here. Um, some of your faces look familiar, and I probably should know your names. Uh, I notice that you guys change a lot, but I never do. <laughs> so I'm 86 next week, if, if I live, that is. Um, Carrie Adams back here is one of my students. Jenny Abeling uh, is back there. And next to her is Beth Alpert, who succeeded me uh, and teaches archaeology now in the Judaic Studies program. Uh, so I have a long history of involvement here. But I don't recognize Tucson anymore. It's changed since I came 45 years ago. You will have to decide for the better. I don't know. Half the year we live in Cyprus, where my wife works. She's an archaeologist. Uh, but in many ways, this is still home, and it's very pleasant to be back. And I thank Ed and his staff for being such wonderful hosts. And Jenny gave a lovely lecture last night. Uh, and I'm, I'm very proud of the 28 students that we turned out. They're all working all over the Middle East, doing wonderful things. And every time I see a publication, and Professor so-and-so, U of A, PhD, ah, I'm so proud. And you should be, too. And you should continue to support the Judaic Studies program uh, and the university. So we had trouble finding this on the, what is this little thing you put in the computer? That thing. I don't trust this technology, and I almost never use it. I'm not sure there's anything in that little box. But if there is, whatever comes up on the screen is what I'm going to talk about. So I have no idea what it will be. Now, you're all familiar with the biblical stories about the golden age of Solomon, right? According to the biblical writers, he ruled over a kingdom that stretched from the Mediterranean coast all the way to the Euphrates River in Mesopotamia. He had 40,000 stables and 12,000 cavalrymen and 1,400 chariots. He wrote over 3,000 proverbs and over 1,000 songs, many of which are in the book of Psalms. It says, a psalm by Solomon. He was the wisest man who ever lived, and also the richest. Everything he touched turned to gold. According to the biblical writers, the gold he imported from one foreign country amounted to 400 pounds a year. That's a lot of gold. And from local taxes, he collected about 700 pounds of gold a year. According to the Bible, he had a forced labor program that recruited 30,000 men. He had about 70,000 uh, laborers of various kinds. He had 80,000 quarrymen and more than 3,300 supervisors. Now, that's more than the entire population of Israel in that. That's, that's a miracle. Uh, not only that, um, he, um, he had 1,000 wives. That's a lot. Two is a lot. So when you read these stories, you really wonder, who's putting us on here? This, this sounds like the stuff of legend, of, of myth. And in an age where everything is fake news, isn't this just more <laughs> fake news? A, a tall tale. Who, who believes any of that? Well, if you pick up the Bible and just read it, you really don't have any choice. It's either true or it's false, and you just make a judgment. How would you possibly question these stories to determine whether there's any truth whatsoever in them? Whether there's any real historical information. You need external evidence, right? Well, the name of Solomon appears nowhere in the vast literature from Mesopotamia or Egypt, though the name of his father, David, does, as we shall see. Now, obviously, the only source of external data would be archaeology, new facts on the ground. And that's what I'm going to talk to you about today. But before we dismiss the Bible altogether in defense of the Bible, there are two references that help us to nail down some facts. In 1 Kings chapter 9, there's a story about an Egyptian pharaoh who came up to southern Canaan, southern Israel, and raided the country. And he destroyed the famous site of Gezer, burnt it with fire, and then he ceded it when he retreated to King Solomon, and he gave one of his daughters to King Solomon for, for a princess, a wife. 
Now, the, the wife business doesn't ring true. Pharaohs didn't do that. But what about the destruction? And who is this Pharaoh who's not named? It's almost certain today that is Pharaoh Seaman of the ill-fated 21st dynasty who died around 960 and whose dates are confirmed by astronomical observations, fixed Egypt. So we've got a date now for the beginning of Solomon's reign, right? Now if you look at the book of Chronicles, which sometimes um, supersedes the accounts in, in Kings, there we are told that five years after Solomon's death, Another Egyptian pharaoh raided again, and his name is given. The Bible calls him Shishak. That is obviously Pharaoh Shoshank of the 22nd dynasty, who died in 925 plus or minus a year. So we know the date of Solomon's death within a year to 930. So if you take the biblical account seriously, 40, year, 40 years, he probably reigned from around 970 to around 930. Maybe not quite that long. Forty years is a round number. So we've got dates for Solomon connected to Egyptian kings who we know, and uh, all of them fall in the 10th century. And we've got the story about fortifications. Now look at 1 Kings chapter 9, verses 15 to 17. According to that story of how Gezer was destroyed, it says then that Solomon built four sites, and the Hebrew word is bana, which means to build, to build up, to fortify, and the sites are named, guess, Jerusalem, his capital, and then three sites are named, Hatzor in Upper Galilee, Megiddo in the Jezreel Valley, and Gezer. So I'm going to talk about the archaeology of those three sites, not four. I will not show you the massive excavations that have been undertaken at the Temple Mount in Jerusalem because they haven't been undertaken and they're not going to be. I don't think we should apply for a license to dig under uh, the Heloxa Mosque or the Dome of the Rock. So we have to leave Jerusalem out. We just don't have any evidence, but we have a lot of evidence from the other sites. So hold on. We're going to go fast. Uh, and then I'll try to sum up a bit, but I want to show you only some of the archaeological evidence to illustrate that famous passage in 1 Kings 9 about the, the rebuilding, the fortification of these three important sites. You all know something about the geography, and uh, we're talking about Israel west of the uh, Jordan River, and that would be the modern state of Israel uh, plus the occupied West Bank. And we're going to move more or less from north to south, now here's the National Geographic artist's notion of a, a great event described. Uh, this is supposed to be uh, the prophet Nathan condemning David uh, for uh, his affairs. And here is supposed to be King Solomon. Now my mentor at Harvard, George Ernest Wright, the leading biblical archaeologist of his era and a great biblical scholar as well, was the advisor. And he, Ernest told me he made enough money from this one article to buy a new car. But it's a little too grandiose. I always like to point out that's the Queen of Sheba who's come to visit Solomon, and she's sort of looking forward to the reception in the evening, if he can get around to her, that is. Well, according to the Bible, he divided the whole country up into 12 districts, one for each month, and of course each district had to supply uh, all of the, his needs at the court. And we have a list of all that he consumed in one month. And again, it's highly imaginary. Nobody could eat that much. Now, here are the three sites I want to talk about. Hatsor was excavated by Yigal Yadin in the 50s, and then more recently, still being excavated by Amnon ben Tor one of his protégés and my oldest friend in Israel. We're all about the same age. We're the second generation of Israeli archaeologists. The first generation is all long gone. And you may find this odd, but with a few deaths last year, of all the archaeologists in the world working in Israel, the Israelis, a few Europeans, some Americans, my students, I'm the oldest person in the world in this field so far. All right, here's the site itself seen in the area. It's a 180-acre site, a huge site. But the Israelite site is down at the bottom where you see the excavated trenches. Now, here is part of the city wall and city gate. Uh, in the background is snow-covered Mount Hermon. This is a very beautiful part of the country. Many, how many of you have been to Israel? You've all been. If you haven't, go. 
quickly, go fast, uh, before the next disaster. In any case, uh, here you see a monumental construction. Uh, this is the gate, which has been attributed by Yadin and others to Solomon. It's a bit reconstructed here, but notice, this is not vernacular architecture. A bunch of villagers didn't get together one day and say, golly gee, let's build a gate for the king. He'll like it. It'll lower our tax base. <laughs> this can only have been commissioned by a king in a capital who could command men and material. It's marvelously engineered and constructed. So remember, this structure is 3,000 years old. Now, in green is the plan of the gate. And notice there's a double wall that we call a casemate wall in green. And then notice it's a multiple entryway gate. It has four pairs of opposing piers, so you had to break all the way through the gate. Now, when Yadin dug this gate, uh, he published it and, and began to think about it uh, and wonder whether there was any parallels. So fix in mind the plan of that distinctive multiple entryway gate. Now, how do we date, how do we know this belongs to the age of Solomon? One way of dating is ceramic dating. We know that pottery changes over time, but in a very regular and predictable way. I, I, whether you believe me or not, if we visited a site in Israel and you picked up some broken pottery on the, on the mound, I could probably date most of that pottery within about 25 years, plus or minus, and my students can do the same thing. So we're able, to, because we can date, certain destruction layers and the pottery they contained with text like the biblical and Egyptian text. So we know what 10th century pottery looks like and our date is formed. Now I know you lie awake at night worrying about what 10th century pottery looks like. So I'll relieve you of your anxiety. So these are typical cooking pots and storage jars and other vessels of a distinctive shape and form of decoration that are almost exclusively found in sites we can date on other grounds to the 10th century. So this is the pottery from the date, uh, the gate at Hatsor. Um, and today it's clearer than ever that that gate is 10th century. Uh, if you go to Israel, you, you can see it partially reconstructed. Now the second site is Megiddo, the great site in the Jezreel Valley. And here you see the cut made by the University of Chicago in the 1920s and 30s. And at the left is David Shishkin, the director of the excavations there. We all grew up together. We're, we're all within a few months of age of each other. Uh, we, we were bad boys then and we're, we're bad boys now. Well, here is the site uh, in plan. And, uh, what we should notice uh, is the blue city is 9th century from the age of Ahab. But the red city is, we argue, from the 10th century, the age of Solomon. Notice at the top the gate under the 9th century gate in blue, the red gate. Notice to the right, Palace 6000, a large building. And then there are two other palaces at the south one of which has its own fortified enclosure wall. This is, again, monumental architecture. This belongs to stratum 5A, 4B of the many strata at the site, the levels in the mound. And again, on the basis of the pottery and other considerations, uh, Yadin and others have always argued that here again we have another one of these double uh, casemate walls and four interway gates. Now notice the masonry, uh, not where it's blocked up, but at the piers, at the corners. That's a special kind of masonry called ashlar masonry, which is hand-dressed to shape, and the chisel marks are still clear. Uh, and this is Phoenician in style. Now, according to the Bible, where did Solomon get the architects and the masons for building a temple which had no precedent? In, he imported them from Hiram, king of Tyre. This is Phoenician masonry, which is exactly uh, it fits the biblical description of the building of the temple precisely. And this kind of masonry is rare in other periods. So we have a style of masonry. Here is what we suppose the gate looked like with a lower gate and an upper gate. And then there you see the city wall with the typical crenellations. This is inspired by Assyrian reliefs that actually illustrate these fortifications. So there's some imagination. By the way, our archaeologists have great imaginations. I gave a lecture once, and one woman said after, I said, what? it was wonderful. But I never heard anybody make so much of so little. <laughs> but it's not all imagination. Uh, 
Now here is part of the palace, and again, you might notice from the man standing at the right, look at the size and the thickness of these city walls. This is not domestic architecture. This is royal architecture. Now here is the southern palace, which is also a very elaborate building. It has its own. And by the way, in the Hebrew Bible, we have the name of the governor of Megiddo under Solomon's administration. This is his palace, I think, without any doubt. So now we're getting very close to the facts on the ground that fit parts, at least, of the biblical story. Not all of it, but parts. Now, here are buildings that the excavators, Chicago excavators, thought were stables because you see the stone basins for watering the horses, and then at the top are the pillars, some of which have holes in them for tethering the horses. Well, it turns out they're neither Solomonic nor stables. Other than that, they were right. Um, here's the artist again of the National Geographic showing Solomon's stables. Well, they all belong to the ninth century, a hundred years after Solomon's death, and furthermore, they are probably not stables but storehouses. Biblical archaeology, as, as you probably know, uh, was, was fairly elaborate in, in, <laughs> in spinning tales, and there are so many scandals that one can deal with, I'd, I'd rather not. So this was the era early in the game when we thought archaeology would prove the Bible, that is to say, our concept of the Bible. We'll talk about proof. Notice I don't use the word much. Now here again in some of the houses you see this same kind of Phoenician masonry. So something's going on in relation to Phoenician art and architecture. Not only that, there was found an Egyptian, uh, a fragment of an Egyptian monumental inscription at Megiddo, and since you all read Egyptian now all together, Shoshank, Shashak. So the same Pharaoh mentioned in Chronicles has left a victory stela at Megiddo. So this seems to underline the fact that indeed he did destroy Megiddo, as he claims in his own inscriptions, which we'll see later. Now here is the site of Gezer, the third site we'll talk about. This is by any account the most, ar the most important archaeological site ever excavated in Israel, namely mine. Um, I started here in 1964 and I've spent much of my life at this site. My students have just finished redoing my excavations there. Uh, I fared pretty well. So it's an important site in the Bible and in the archaeological record, and here you see the great mound seen from the distance. Not very far inland from the airport at Lydda. Um, it's a borderline site between Israel and Judah. So it's important because the other two sites we looked at are northern, but this belongs to Judah, the southern kingdom of Solomon. Now here is the plan of the gate we excavated at the top left. You, you see the similarity to the other two gates? It's a four entryway gate. And look to the right, you see the same double wall. And look at the bottom, there's an outer gate, exactly like the gate at Megiddo. Now when Yadin excavated the gate at Hatsor, he turned to Megiddo and the old gate there that he had seen, and then he turned back to an excavation report published in 1912 by a British archaeologist, Robert Alexander Stewart McAllister, who excavated at Gezer. McAllister didn't recognize, he excavated half of this, and he said a very strange structure. Yadin looked at the plan and he said, no, this is half of another gate, the same one mentioned in 1 Kings 9, Hatsor, Megiddo, Gezer. And in 1958, he published an article, Solomon City Gate at Gezer, now, in 1984, when I was digging at Gezer, uh, we had more evidence to confirm Yadin's view that this gate was really Solomon. And I called him on Thursday, and I said, I, th I think you should come out tomorrow. We have good news for you. He died of a massive heart attack the next night. I went to his funeral on Saturday. But shortly before he died, he was... <laughs> he talked to the press and he said, one of the great things in my life was discovering the Solomonic Gate at Gezer on paper, because it had been buried by McAllister in 1912 and nobody living had ever seen it. So on paper, he, he figured out these gates, and what he said was this, and remember, Yadin had some experience in military affairs, he was chief of staff during the, six, the, the 48 war. And he said, all of these gates can only have been built by a royal commission, built by a, a corps of engineers. They're built on the same blueprints. And you know what? They are almost identical, even down to the dimensions. 
So uh, was Yadin right? And are the biblical writers right that really Solomon did fortify these sites? Well, let's look at some more evidence. Now here's the Gezer Gate looking from the outside out into the valley below where the road would have come up. Now it may not look so impressive here, but it is the finest example of Iron Age architecture ever found in Israel. There's another one of my students right back there. Hi, Gary. <laughs> I, I have them numbered, and I still take a roll, and I still grade them. <laughs> so uh, I, I'll raise your grade. Yeah, you, 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 <laughs> glad to see you. Okay, here's an artist's notion of what the gate looked like. It's not just a gate. It's a gate. It's a magnificent three-structure gate, probably with huge towers. Look at the person standing there for scale. So from the beginning, we dated this uh, gate to the 10th century and publish it as a Solomonic gate. Now skeptics begin to comment. Israel Finkelstein is one of Israel's most prominent archaeologists, a bit younger than I. Uh, we grew up together, except he never did. Uh, he, he's still a bad boy. Uh, we fought for years, and for the most part he enjoyed it. But several years, about 20 years ago, Finkelstein, Finkelstein started what he called a low chronology. He looked at all these gates and he said, no, they're not 10th century. All this must be dated down to the 9th century. So the whole story about Solomon is entirely fictional. There, there was no such king. There was no capital in Jerusalem. All this is fiction. And he said there was no state even in the north till the 9th century, and Judah was probably not a state till the 8th century, 200 years later. Now, I'm going to argue that the low chronology has finally been laid to rest, and I'll show you the evidence. So, I think we were right. This gate does date to the 10th century, not the 9th or the 8th, and it is indeed Solomonic. Now, uh, if we look at the plan again, um, I want to comment on some details. Here is a probe into the outer gate, and whether you can see clearly, I'm not sure, but notice that although it's fine masonry, the stones have been displaced. Some of them are cracked. Some of them are burned. Remember the story of the Pharaoh who destroyed Gezer with fire just before Solomon rebuilt it? And below this, we found perhaps six feet of ashy mud brick debris. Uh, now, back in those days, we didn't do carbon-14 dating. The, the technique wasn't perfected yet. So we dated the gate on pottery. We argued it was built after a big destruction sometime uh, in the early 10th century. Now the other thing we discovered when we went down, these foundations, some of them go down nearly 10 feet below the surface, below the roadway. And I remember the day I called for a spirit level uh, to check them. And after 3,000 years, the foundations are less than a quarter of a cent uh, an inch out of plumb. That's engineering. That's royal engineering. And even below ground, where you couldn't see anything, the stones are all beautifully dressed. And again, a bunch of farmers didn't build this gate one day. This is royal construction. Yadin was right. I don't know whether there was only one blueprint, but somebody knew what they were doing. The engineering is spectacularly good. Uh, now, I noticed that one of the displaced stones had a funny backward L mark. And I show it to you here. Well, what is that? Uh, and then I noticed on another one a kind of a lopsided H mark. These are Mason's marks. Now remember the story of how the temple was built. There was not the sound of a hammer heard on the temple mount. The stones were quarried and marked at the quarry and then laid together, you know, connect tab A to tab B. So there, these are Mason's marks. Now guess what? The same Mason's marks, which I will show you, were found at Megiddo and also at the capital in Samaria. The very same marks. And here's a chart. Uh, here's Gesser, for instance. M is Megiddo. S is Samaria. And if you look carefully over to the left in the center column, second from the left, you see the H. And then the L is also clearly. Now at Megiddo, the Chicago excavators could still see the red chalk lines on the stones where the chalk line was snapped to make a straight line. So th this is fantastic masonry, and it's absolutely Phoenician in style. So the biblical story, which sounds strange, of stones pre-marked and then assembled, is absolutely what we have. Now here is the northern part of the site where McAllister excavated, and he published plans like this. They don't make any sense whatsoever. We now know that he, he mushed together several strata, so these buildings are fragments of buildings centuries apart. But notice the city wall. 
So the question is, Solomon built a gate. Did he build a wall at Gezer in the 10th century? Anything we can date. Well, this may not be too clear, but when we penetrated all the way down to the bottom uh, of this wall, we learned that it was an earlier Canaanite period wall, and it was rebuilt by Solomon. And now we think that the vast city wall that runs for more than a mile around the site was really reconstructed. So Solomon didn't fortify the site anew. It had long since been fortified. He rebuilt the fortifications, and he inserted a number of towers with this typical Phoenician masonry. He barred a lot of ideas. He, he barred a lot of wives. Uh, and, but you know, here's Solomon's genius. He made everybody pay for it and like it. Think about that when April comes around. Well, here is the scene. I always draw a man for scale. He's one meter tall. And here you see the Canaanite wall, LB at the bottom, and then you see in the top the center wall. So that's, I think, this wall that Solomon used to connect the whole site, and then he built a single gate, probably over the old gate, which has never been excavated. Now, when we look back at the gate, we notice things like this again. These stones are cracked and burned and displaced. And look at the woman pointing to a, a white sort of lava-like flow. That's molten lime. Uh, the, the stones have been heated to such a degree they have melted and created lime. So this is vivid, vivid evidence of the destruction of the site that the Egyptian pharaoh claims to have accomplished. And the gate was so badly destroyed, this part had to be blocked up. Now this gate has 14 street levels over 800 years. And it is destroyed after the third street level. So if Solomon built it sometime early in his career, 30 years later, it was destroyed by Shoshank, who actually names Gezer in his battle itinerary. So I think we have the gate built early in Solomon's reign and then destroyed shortly after his death, precisely as both the Bible and the Egyptian records note. Coincidence? I don't think so. Now, here again is what the pottery evidence suggests. If you look at the top left shirt, you can tell that the potter has taken the pot when it's sort of leather hard, not quite dry, and use a stone or a tool to work the clay in such a way that it takes on a kind of polish. This is called burnishing. And notice it's done by hand. You can see how the strokes go all over. That's typical 10th century hand burnished pottery. That's what we have in the gate and the city wall. Now, if you look at some of the others, you can see it was done on a wheel. And by the 9th century, the pottery is treated in a different style. So Finkelstein said, oh, Deaver went to Gezer with the Bible in one hand and a trowel in the other. He's just an old-fashioned Bible archaeologist trying to prove the Bible. I'm afraid not. We were dating in the same way all archaeologists date, on the basis of stratigraphy, the layering of the site, and ceramic typology. And by the way, uh, if you want a typical 10th century cooking pot, look at the one on the left. The 9th century, those cooking pots look totally different. Today, I'm going to be confident and say our 10th century date has been totally confirmed by subsequent excavations at Gezer and everywhere else. And Figelstein has been notoriously quiet recently. He's retired, uh, but uh, he's still around. There was a huge symposium in April in Israel, and I gave the plenary address on the 10th century in a capital in Jerusalem. He was not invited. So uh, I think his views have been outdated. And I want to show you a little bit more in a moment. Now, here are the different gates we've been looking at. And again, you see how close. Now, if you remember, we looked at a palace building west of the gate at Gezer, which my students have gone back and have now excavated the whole building. Now, we didn't have C-14 dates when I excavated, but we do now. And in the last few months, we have two secure C-14 dates from short live samples from excellent loci in the palace. Now remember I've said the reign of Solomon, we now know, was about 960 or 970 to 930. The C-14 dates come out 975 to 925. Close enough? Scientific proof. So we have now a, a better system of dating, and it agrees with our conventional methods of dating. That evidence, I think, will be hard to, to dispense with. Now, once again, I want to stress that Yadin was right. Somebody uh, has sufficient resources to commission these gates, to see that they're built, to see that they're well-engineered, that they're rebuilt when necessary. Did they work? 
Unfortunately not. They were all destroyed. By the way, archaeologists are real ghouls. They love destruction layers. If nobody got away, that's even better because everything is there, right on the floor where they left it. Um, and we were not fortunate. This gate was badly dug by, by McAllister, and there wasn't much, but there was enough pottery to date it. Now, let's look at Jerusalem, but only briefly. Uh, here is an aerial view of the city of David, which extends south from the Dung Gate of the walled city, the 16th century city, and here you see a sort of plan of that spur called the spur of the Ophel above the old spring, the Gihon Spring, and uh, up above at the top, approximately where the Al-Aqsa Mosque now is inside the wall, would have been Solomon's royal buildings. And here he would have had a palace, here would be the temple, and here would be the dormitory for all the wives uh, in a sort of schedule, you know. Uh, well, I, I won't go further. But this also sort of, uh, I don't know, imagination. In any case, we have never been able to excavate at the Temple Mount itself for obvious reasons. But Yigal Shiloh uh, carried out extensive excavations after the 67 war, when the area became available, following up the old excavations of Kenyon, we can say something about Jerusalem, but we don't have any direct evidence for either the temple or the city gate or the city walls, and we probably never will have. But you have to imagine, if Solomon fortified these regional centers, he would have fortified his capital as well. Here's a good artist's notion of what Solomon's Jerusalem looked like. Now, you might think it was the capital of a mighty kingdom. It was a, a town of a at most about 2,000 people. So the kingdom of Solomon was not very large, uh, even by le ancient Levantine standards, but it was a kingdom, and it had a capital. And most of the architecture that we know is, again, monumental architecture. So Jerusalem was a typical royal city um, of, of, of a typical petty state of the period. Now here's a structure uh, long known. It was excavated partly by McAllister and then by Kenyon and later scholars as well, and notice it's a kind of terrace, a stone-reinforced stepped terrace. Now, according to the Bible, Solomon built or rebuilt something called a milo, and the Hebrew word means to fill, a filling. And here you have, I think, what is the biblical milo? It's an artificial filled terrace on which houses were built below the temple, all close to the temple, part of the royal quarter, I think. And so, I, I think we can connect these structures too, um, and they, we've excavated under them in particular. Yigal Shiloh was my closest friend. We grew up together in Israel. Our children grew up together. Yigal died at 51 of stomach cancer, and it was a great loss to our field. He didn't live to publish, but the excavation is being published by his friends and colleagues, and by Tammy, his widow, who has overseen the work to this day. I miss, I miss Yigal. Is this also to the south? This is directly south of the Dungay. Uh, you can see it if you go to the Ir David National Park. By the way, this is close to my heart. Six weeks ago, I was invited to Jerusalem to address a major rally on the subject of Solomon's capital in Jerusalem. And I stood here in the archaeological park at night and lectured for a thousand people. It's uncanny. And guess what my topic was? Jerusalem, the eternal capital. I got cheers. I got, it was like a Trump rally almost. I don't know. Um, now here's one artist's notion of what the temple might have looked like, but we have no direct evidence. We have the biblical description, but we do have dozens of ancient Phoenician and Canaanite temples which are built on the same plan. So the, the description in the Bible looks fantastic. Some of the Hebrew words occur only once, and we're not quite sure what they mean. But the biblical writers didn't make it up. They had seen the building, even though they were writing perhaps two or three centuries later. So I think there was a temple, and maybe it looked something like this. Uh, now at Tel Tainat, this is being re-excavated in Syria, is the ninth century temple built on the same tripartite plan. By the way, in the Hebrew Bible, we have the names of the three rooms, and the inner sanctuary, uh, where only the high priest went, and only once a year, that's called the Devir. Well, my name is Dever, which in Hebrew, unfortunately, means plague or pestilence. <laughs> it's one of the things, the ten plagues, we want to avoid, avoid Dever. Uh, I, I, I changed it. I pronounce it Devir, the Holy of Holies of the Temple, so I'm Professor Sacred Shrine, something like that. <laughs> I like that much better. 
But we have parallels. And here's one artist's notion of what the Temple at Tainat looked like, a Phoenician temple. Uh, and here we see some of the masonry at other sites as well. This is at Samaria. Here are some notions from various scholars of what the capitals look like and the columns and all the rest. And I pass over it rather quickly. Um, but by the way, this is found at Kition in Cyprus. The Bible describes bronze braziers, which were apparently square and had a provision for a big bowl on top. And it, they're said to be equipped with spoked wheels and they're decorated with bulls and, and birds and flowers. And that again sounds quite fantastic. This fits the biblical description exactly, and it's at least a century earlier. So Solomon simply borrowed Phoenician styles of furnishings for the temple. What else would we expect him to do? So we can parallel today almost all the furnishings of the temple in one way or another from sites elsewhere. Now remember the cherubs in the temple in the inner sanctum? This is probably what they looked like. We have dozens, if not hundreds, of examples. We know what the cherubs were. We know what they looked like. By the way, you're not supposed to have any art in Israel, right? I'm afraid this is art, but it's Phoenician art. It's Phoenician art. Here is the only possible survivor of the Temple of Solomon, a, a thumb-sized ivory pomegranate head, which was bought in Jerusalem on the black market, so we don't know its provenance. Around the top is a, dis, a Hebrew inscription, which says, set apart for the house or temple of, and then the name of the deity is broken. Now, after much study and much controversy, we're pretty sure this is an authentic piece probably robbed from the excavations by paid workers, and the inscription is probably a modern forgery. Wouldn't it be wonderful to have the name of, of, of either Yahweh, the God of Israel, or maybe Asherah, his lady, his lady friend? I would prefer Asherah. But in any case, this is not a genuine relic. It doesn't have any province. For a long time, it, it had its own case in Jerusalem. It has been quietly removed. So we don't have any surviving artifacts of the temple. Now, this is a site that is in the news today. Look at the site of Endara, way up there east of Tarsus. Do you know where al Bakr Baghdadi was killed? He was killed right where that arrow is. I've been to that site. I've been to that village many times. I know that village. I, know the I think I know the compound, as a matter of fact. You won't ever go there, and I won't ever go there again. But there was an excavation at the site of Endara, which is fabulous. Now, here are some of the tripartite temples, three-room temples that we know, and one of them is the temple at Endara. Here is the site in the closer map, Endara. It's on the Afrin River, which in, it was in, it's in Kurdish territory today. I've been there many times. And when you drive along the river, it's, by the way, it's a beautiful part of northwestern Syria, always claimed by Turkey. You come to the site. And here in an aerial view, you see the site, and right on top of the hill is this monumental building. And if you walk up the road, you see these huge basalt lions which once stood guarding the Acropolis. And when you get closer, you find the ruined temple built in black volcanic basalt. It's a fabulously beautiful building. And it's built on the same tripart plan, almost the same dimensions as the biblical description of Solomon's temple. And it's dated to the ninth century, not long after Solomon's death. It's the closest parallel we have today. But look at the entrance. The temple is badly ruined in the Assyrian destructions, but you can still make out some things. Uh, here is what it looks like. And then if you visit the site, you see Cherubs, very much like the, these are Phoenician or Aramean in style, uh, but the biblical cherubs are like that. We see these, this guillotine pattern, which is described in the biblical text, and here it is executed in the motifs around the base. And then according to the Bible, there were, there were sort of triple recessed windows, and the Hebrew is very difficult. But you see triple recessed windows in the temple at Aindara. There was a Harvard dissertation done. There are more than 60 exact parallels between the biblical text in 1 Kings 6 to 9 and this temple, which has never been published and probably never will be, and I'm sure it's been destroyed. Now, if you come to the entrance, here is what you see. I put down my pocket comb and emptied my canteen, and that's a foot, a huge footprint. 
the left foot. Then if you go up to the next step, there's the right foot. And at the top, there are two feet. Now, in all the West Semitic languages, the word bet means not only house and dynasty, but temple. This is the house of the deity. And you can't see him, but you can see his footprints. I, it, it's an incredible feeling. I never tell people. I just walk in and let them see. You feel the God is in his temple. You couldn't see God in this temple in Jerusalem, but he was present. Present, if not visibly, then viscerally, at least. And here you see the actual gods in the Aleppo Museum from this temple. So, so Yahweh, the God of Israel, was invisible, but no less at home in his house. I could write a whole book. I could teach a whole semester course on Solomon's temple. We know that much, at least uh, implicitly. Now, we've mentioned Shoshank, or Shishak of the Bible. And here, this is a geographical itinerary of his inscription found in, in Egypt. And because it's in order, we can identify the sites by number. And Gezer is on the site. And you see Gezer right there, where the arrow is pointing. And then he avoided Jerusalem. Uh, and, and again, the Bible doesn't claim he destroyed Jerusalem, destroyed Gezer. Then he went all the way up north and destroyed some other sites. Dozens of them he claimed. Now, here is the actual inscription, which you can still see today uh, at Luxor in Egypt. And notice, he's holding like dogs on a leash uh, all the cities that he's destroyed. They're little cartouches. And one of them says Gezer. So, remember, he died in 925. So his, his destruction at Gezer cannot be any later. Well, I went years ago to Beth Shan when Ami Bazar was digging there when he was still a boy, and I saw the same kind of destruction layer. And I said, well, Ami, this, is, this must be Sheshonk. So we have a number of actual descriptions uh, in the Egyptian record of sites destroyed, and we have excavated the ruins and have been able to show. And notice we can date the pottery from the dated destruction. That's, here is the uh, destruction debris, very much like the destruction debris flowing down in the gate at Gezer. And this would be due to the same destruction a few years after Solomon's death. Now, here is a recent site, Tel Rehov, where Ami has just concluded long excavations. Not an important site in the Bible, but several years ago when I was there, we decided to do C-14 dates. And I helped take the samples, and I brought them to one of the best carbon-14 laboratories in the world. Where do you think that was? University of Arizona. I hand-carried the sample, and we dated it here. Guess how the dates came out? 975 to 925, with a very small margin of error. So at another site, uh, which we can connect with the biblical account, we have now C14 dates, and these have been fully published. Uh, Finkelstein doesn't comment on these dates very much. He doesn't like them. Uh, well, tough. Now, we don't have the name of Solomon anywhere, but we might have the name of David on this stele found in, in Transjordan uh, at Deban, the capital of the state of Moab. It's not certain, it's broken, but some scholars read the name David, Solomon's father. Uh, here we have from Gezer itself a calendar, uh, an agricultural, a schoolboy's exercise, which is probably dated to the 10th century. So one could argue by the 10th century, another aspect of statehood is developing literacy. The, the ability to keep records, bureaucracy. Bureaucracies are as old as, as any administration we know. So we know that some people could keep records, and we know that some of the stories of the Bible were probably already being written in one form or another in the 10th century. Now, all of you know about this famous inscription found in 1993 by Avraham Beran at Tel Dan on the northern border. I, I was there shortly after it was found, and I've handled it. It's wonderful. It has its own case in the Israel Museum. It's partly broken, but right down in this area, right in here, you read Bet David, Dynasty of David. Now, in Europe, there's a whole school of revisionists, negativists, who, who, who think the Bible was all written much later in the Persian period or the Roman period. There's, there's, there's no historical information whatsoever in the Bible. So when this inscription found dated to the 9th century, clearly reading David, was, was published, what did they say? Oh, they said it's a forgery. It's a, it's a forgery. Really? Well, we know where the fakery is here. Uh, everybody who's ever handled it and, and discussed it knows that it's no forgery. Not only does it name David, it names two kings of Israel and Judah, the same names we have in the Hebrew Bible. So we have extra biblical evidence, written evidence, if not for Solomon, for his father. Close enough? <laughs> so once again, 
Uh, I published last year a huge history of ancient Israel entitled Beyond the Text, an archaeological portrait of ancient Israel and Judah. It's becoming a standard textbook. So I wrote a history of Israel almost without the Bible, almost all based on archaeological evidence. Uh, and so I argued that henceforth, in future, all new histories of Israel will have to begin with the archaeological ref, not, not the text. It's the archaeological data that, that, that are now primary evidence. And you know what model I used? A jurisprudence model. So th the text of the Bible are innocent, presumed innocent, unless we can prove them guilty. Um, what we depend on is the preponderance of the evidence, which doesn't mean two-thirds. It means just over 50 percent. And finally, a judgment beyond reasonable doubt. There will always be doubts. Archaeologists not prove the Bible to be true, even historically. I, I never use the word proof, except beyond a reasonable doubt. My argument is simple. Based on the evidence we have and giving a, the, you know, the doubt to the uh, biblical text, putting it all together, we can say with confidence, beyond a reasonable doubt, that while all the stories about Solomon may not necessarily be true, there was nevertheless a king named Solomon, who lived in the 10th century and who built monumental structures around the country. Whether he was God's anointed, I, I leave to you. And I don't know how good a musician he was. But, but there was a Solomon. We can at least say that much. And then I want to close with the smoking gun. Here, by the way, is where it reads Beit Nefait. So I won't tell you all the fantastic readings the revisionists came up with. Absurd. Um, <laughs> The evidence was inconvenient for their, for their theory. Um, well, this is a site uh, about a, a day's walk southwest of Jerusalem called Kermet Keafa. It was not even known 30 years ago. But about 20 years ago, scholars began to look at it. And then a series of excavations were carried out here uh, by Israeli uh, scholars, particularly Yossi Garfinkel. And the associate director, the co-director of the site was by accident, one of my students. I, I don't know how that happened, uh, but uh, I, I plant them, you see, so I keep informed that way. By the way, they published in full. Now, the importance of this site is it's essentially a one-period site. And the carbon-14 dates and the pottery dates, everybody agrees, even Finkelstein, are early in the 10th century. So this is almost certainly a site that was fortified by David the founder of the dynasty. And, and I think that that is almost beyond any reasonable doubt. Here is a site, a beautiful site. It's only about a mile from the Philistine border. It's a hilltop site. It's very remote. It's a long walk to go up there. I, I was there six weeks ago. Again, I've been there many, many times. Uh, so it's, it's a border site, a fortress on the Philistine border. And notice, if you count the building of the wall, 200,000 tons of stone were brought in to fortify this site within a very short period of time. It's planned, deliberately planned, and the plan is extraordinary. If you look, all the private houses are not, in fact, private houses. They're built into the city wall. The, this is where uh, soldiers were garrisoned with their families, and, and they, they lived right inside the city wall. Now, the whole middle part hasn't been excavated but enough has been excavated to know something. So not only do we have a massive city wall, but we have two gates. No other site uh, ever excavated in the Iron Age has two gates. By the way, what is the name? The, the Arabic name doesn't help us, Kirbet Keatha. The Hebrew name doesn't help us. But in the Bible, there's a town called Sha'araim. All of you Hebraists, what form is Sha'araim? It's the dual form, the dual form, two gates. So I think this is a biblical Sha'arim. And the date, again, see 14 dates, carbon, 14 dates, pottery dates. So I think we have a royal uh, barracks town uh, from the t time of King. It's destroyed, probably by the Philistines, because it's a border site. Uh, here's some of the pottery. Uh, everybody agrees. Here's the plan of one of the gates. Notice they're not four entrance, but they're three entrance. They're slightly simplified. But this is like other gates. Here's the best town we 
town plan, we have at Beersheba, and if you notice, the same houses are built into the wall. These are not ordinary towns. These are barracks towns. They, they were built again by David in the course of the wars with the Philistines, which are described in a lot of detail. By the way, I recently, as an archaeologist, reworked the text about David's wars. It's fascinating. If you look at the Philistine sites that are said to have been destroyed, and then you look at the excavated evidence, you can tell where the border was. And you know what? Most of those sites were destroyed early, early in the 10th century, and most of them were in decline thereafter. The biblical writers, when they wanted to be, could be good historians. They nailed it. Their description of David's wars with the Philistines has the ring of truth about it. Sometimes they spun tales, but when they wanted to, they could, they could be good historians. We even have written material uh, in Proto-Hebrew. The old Canaanite uh, language and script are being adopted now for royal use. Um, so here you see the plan, and here you see some of the site. And once again, this is fantastic. By the way, just to supply this city would have been incredible. You can barely get up there with a jeep. Uh, you have to walk most of the way. So how in the world did they ever provision this site? But they did. And for at least 20 years it held out uh, against the... F it was probably destroyed by the Philistine site of Gath, which is only about three miles away. So this site, Kirbet K. Alpha, now fully published. By the way, there's a brand new popular book published by Timson Hudson in London on the city of David. And it's this site, K. Alpha. So when you put the evidence together, I think it begins. Here are some of the cultic items. So I'm going to stop at that point and tease you a little bit, uh, hoping you'll look at that book, uh, the popular book about the site. And I want to close with this observation. Why should we expect the Bible to be modern history? It isn't. When we talk about history, we mean the academic discipline, which is hardly older than the 18th century. When the ancients did history, they told stories. That's what Herodotus did, and Thucydides, and the, the biblical writers. They told stories, and they felt free to embellish the stories on occasion. This may shock you, but the Bible is largely propaganda. It happens to be good propaganda because it's for us. It, we agree with it, but, but the, the biblical writers don't claim to be unbiased. They're telling you the way it was because God said it to them, and now they're telling you. So sit up, listen. Um, remember... Thus saith Yahweh. <laughs> They're telling stories. They're always stories about a moral and ethical value. Now, when I published my big book, I revised the history of ancient Israel in a rather radical way. So I thought, I can do better than that. So I finished a popular book recently. It's entitled, Has Archaeology Buried the Bible? And my answer is it has not. We have had to rewrite the history of ancient Israel based on our new information. We can never unknow what we know. You cannot read the Bible the way your saintly grandparents read it. You, you have to take the new information. And we're going to know much more about the Bible in the next 20 years. Uh, we know, you won't believe this, but today we know about the archaeology of Israel at least 20 times what was known when I was a graduate student. At least 20 times. I wrote an 800-page book. I could have written a whole shelf of books. We know that much. So keep tuned into archaeology. It, Albright, the great founder of American-style biblical archaeology, once talked about the archaeological revolution in our understanding of the Bible. Well, we have revolutionized our understanding, but not in the way Albright thought. He thought archaeology will prove all the biblical stories to be correct. We have shown that some of them have to be corrected. But here's the point I want to make. I'm an archaeologist, which means I'm a historian. I, I work with text when I have them. I'm glad to have them. But basically, I write history from things. You won't believe this either. Archaeologists are peculiar creatures. When I walked in the room, I started looking at the building materials. That's what I do. And I don't listen to what you say. I watch the way you move and the way you dress. And that's, that's the way we think. We, we think about things and what they can tell us. Things are the embodiment of human thoughts and hopes and fears. So that's the way we do history. And the new histories are going to be radically different. As an archaeologist, I can tell you with, with certainty in many cases what happened. I can tell you where it happened. I can tell you when it happened. I can tell you how it happened. And I can tell you what the ancients probably thought it meant. 
And I can tell you what Jewish rabbis and sages thought and what church fathers thought. I cannot tell you what it should mean for you. You have to decide. I can tell you what the facts are, the facts on the ground. And I can tell you what it was like to live in ancient Israel. By the way, Jenny Abling has written a wonderful book about the lives of women in ancient Israel. And it has the ring of truth about it. Because I lived for long periods of time in Arab, primitive Arab villages. And, and I know what it was like, and so does she. It's a wonderful book. So we, we know a lot about the past. But if you, want to, if you want to draw moral lessons, I suggest you consult your rabbi uh, or, or your priest uh, or uh, your pastor or, or perhaps a learned theologian. Um, I'm not going to tell you what I think. But in the new book, which is coming out in July, I argue that reading the Bible critically does not make it any less meaningful for our lives today. If archaeology doesn't teach us lessons about the past, lessons of life and death, it's a waste of time and resources. So, listen, look, read, and think. The biblical writers told you a story. They wanted you to think deeply about its meaning. You know what faith is in the biblical sense? It's betting your life that in the end they were right. Thank you. My students are used to my moralizing in class, so they'll forgive me. Um, yeah, I, I like questions, and, and I'm glad to take a few, sir. I just wondered, since the stones were so massive, are they built near these gates in town? Are they built near uh, quarry? Um, in Jerusalem, we think we have the quarry.